This is the latest in our sense-making series, with one of the most essential thinkers to understand what the big tech platforms and social media in particular are doing to us. Tristan Harris has been called the closest thing that Silicon Valley has to a conscience and was named by Rolling Stone magazine as one of the 25 people shaping the world. Until 2016, he worked at Google as a design ethicist until he became so concerned about the direction that the attention economy was going. Social media is distorting all of those signals, all of those heuristics, all of those vulnerabilities of the human mind at every single level. I think that the way to see this is that um, the, the technology has become the new 21st century infrastructure, but is more intimately embedded into our, our, our minds and our nervous systems. Since then, he's made it his mission to reconnect technology with human values through the center for humane technology. In this conversation, we covered how the incentive structure of the attention economy was rewarding polarization and division. To get attention within that, that sphere, I have to use outrage. So both sides, the left and the right, are using outrage to get people to get to get people's attention. And then that just further cleaves the kind of divide between, I think it's 2011 and uh, 2018, between the left and the right, you just see it moving further and further apart. The paradox of free speech in a world of finite attention. This is one of the most critical issues of our time, and we're, we're missing the philosophical distinctions we need. Uh, it's important to realize that free speech absolutism and, and just the, the valuing of free speech was, was valued philosophically by the Founding Fathers at a time when we had an abundance of attention. Um, we needed to make sure that people who um, wanted to speak wouldn't be silenced. But we never thought about, is there a finite number of ears to hear everything? Or do we have a vast overabundance of information and speech compared to the finite number of ears that we have to hear? And how, if we really wanted to reverse this process, we'd need to recover the concept of consciousness or attention as being something sacred. If we really need to make new choices and put new choices on life's menu, then we need to be able to have a basis of attention, a basis of consciousness that allows us to do something different or new, to think something new that we weren't thinking before. And we have a system right now with social media that broadly narrows the space of human sense-making and choice by reinforcing the old biases. Yes, those other people on the other side are still wrong. Yes, uh, you know, those people over there still don't like me or still, I still need that attention from them. We're, we're narrowing the human experience. And I, the big question we're going to have is, can we go back and treat this as something sacred? Tristan, thank you very much for joining me. Happy to be here, David. Great. This series is about sense-making, and I think this is a really, really key part of sense-making, understanding why we're often kind of all at sea and how, our, how we're being manipulated. Um, and you also have a lot of the same reference points uh, to us. We're friends with many of the same people. I'm sure viewers of the channel will be familiar with Daniel Schmachtenberger's work. Jordan Hall, Eric Weinstein. And I know that you agree with, with, with what we've been saying and what Daniel's been saying, that the sense-making crisis is really central to understanding and dealing with any, any of the other problems that we've got. I'd like to start, why do you think that the sense-making crisis is central or how would you frame it initially? Um, yeah, well, Technology is, has become the sense-making instrument uh, for you know, 3 billion people. And I think that's never been more true in a coronavirus era um, because with many of us stuck at home, we are peering through the glasses, the telescope of social media out there to understand what's happening in the world. Because we're not walking around in the world as much. You know, there's fewer journalists out there. Uh, we have, a, ironically, due to social media's privatization of the attention sphere, um, they've actually hollowed out journalistic organizations. So there's fewer journalists actually going out there because it's less profitable to run local news organizations. So we are really left to, you know, this set of plot, these set of platforms to make sense of what's going on in the world. Um, and it's become the primary sense-making vehicle. I mean, in my first to introduce uh, your viewers or listeners to some of my work initially, um, I, when I was at Google as a design ethicist, had, had made this presentation back in 2013 saying, never before in history have essentially 50 designers at three tech companies determine what 2 billion people's attention is going to be on a daily basis. And that we, as those technology designers, have a moral responsibility in holding the kind of collective consciousness carefully uh, because we don't have a choice. I mean, we, we can't not hold it. We can't just take our hand off the steering wheel and just let chaos rule. I mean, we are shaping 3 billion people's attention on a daily basis. 
So the question is, what do we do with that responsibility? And when you use algorithms, uh, automated programs, automated rules, like whatever gets the most clicks should go to the top of people's feeds, whatever gets the most likes or shares, those are three different ways to rank a newsfeed, but they are imprecise in what they're selecting for. And they tend to select, as everybody now knows, I think, for the kind of outrage or extreme uh, uh, you know, attention-grabbing things, which do not correlate with the kinds of different editorial rules or algorithms that you as a, you know, someone who was in journalism before doing this podcast would, would choose to rank what's going to happen in this interview. I mean, when you proceed in this interview right now with me, you're not going to be sorting by let, what question could I ask you next that will cause the most attention to continue. And uh, there are actors who can win that way and games theoretically, if they outcompete the other actors, that's what causes this kind of what we call the race to the bottom of the brainstem uh, for attention that uh, if actors are just acting on the basis for what gets the most attention, whether that's a journalist or Trump uh, who actually does actually operate this way uh, or uh, technology platforms, you end up with a very different kind of collective consciousness and collective psyche than um, if you're actually making grounded, editorial, thoughtful, values-based decisions. And we tend to not be very articulate about what values we would choose to curate what should go into our attentional lives, um, both individually in that we let lots of things rush into our psyche the moment we wake up in the morning and uh, you look at your phone within the first two minutes of getting up um, uh, and you know collectively. Yeah, in the first film in this series, I put out a quote from Jonathan Haidt where he talked about that in, I think he, he dated it back to about 2013, 2014, that effectively what we have been doing is the equivalent of doubling the gravitational constant. And he sort of, get, I thought it was a beautiful analogy because he said, imagine that you change the gravitational constant, all sorts of weird things would start happening. Planes would start falling out of the sky. You'd find it more difficult to walk, all of these sort of things. And he, he said, that's kind of what we've been doing with social media. And that really kind of frames, I think, why everything feels just more intense, that it's just raised the intensity of everything, that suddenly we're... Every, even our, even our conversations are becoming performative. We've got this sort of sense of a hollowing out of the private sphere and this sort of sense of being disconnected from what we actually really think because we're, we're now doing something because we think that's what other people will reward us for or everything starts to become this kind of weird, I don't know, hollowed out sort of sense. Um, do you find that a useful metaphor? Yeah, Jonathan uh, Hyde is a, is a friend, and we've had many conversations about this. I think his metaphor is exactly spot on. Um, we similarly use this metaphor of ergonomics, that there's kind of a, um, you know, a- imagine the world before the field of ergonomics. You know, you sit in a chair that's not ergonomic at all. And let's say we don't actually have a fine grain understanding of the geometry of the human back or the lumbar or, you know, uh, you know, the, you know the, the right proportionality for what a chair should be for it to be comfortable for many hours a day. If you're only in that chair for, let's say, 10 minutes a day, you don't really need a field, of, a field of ergonomics as crucially or essentially as if you're in that chair for, let's say, 12 hours a day. Um, and essentially, we, we don't have a good self-understanding um, with technology of what are the ergonomics of a society? What are the folds? Um, you can think of it, you know, our co-founder for the Center for Human Technology, Azar Raskin, has this metaphor of origami that, you know, origami has these kinds of pre-folds. And if you fold along the pre-folds, you get this beautiful picture, uh, this beautiful, um, you know, uh, constructed object. Uh, if you don't fold on the pre-folds, you get something that's just kind of messy and doesn't really work. And I think that when it comes to human nature, there are prefolds to our human needs and values and how we make sense of the world well. If you take our well-being, there are prefolds in terms of about how much sleep we probably all should be getting. The fact that if you look at our prefolds around uh, the human eye and screens, we really shouldn't be looking at blue light late at night because blue light tricks our melatonin system into thinking that we shouldn't uh, go to bed, and then that can screw up some of the cancer cleanup processes in the human body. So. The interesting thing here, uh, so that's on the well-being side. On the sense-making side, there's pre-folds around um, trusting that if people around me are saying something is true, I tend to believe that that thing is true. Um, 
meaning we are, we are very highly influenced by social influence and social proof. The more other people or 10 of my friends say that this is true, the more it, it, it really feels like it must be true. And those heuristics are useful from the savanna because you would rely on the other people in your tribe to let you know, you know, is, that, is there actually a tiger out there in the wilderness and did they see it yesterday? And I should really trust those people. But social media is distorting all of those signals, all of those heuristics, all of those vulnerabilities of the human mind at every single level. And that's why I think Jonathan's metaphor of, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's as if it's changing the gravitational constant or the, the other coefficients that make the universe sort of stand up and not collapse into itself. Uh, social media has distorted all those things. Um, I think that the way to see this is that um, the, the technology has become the new 21st century infrastructure, but is more intimately embedded into our, our, our minds and our nervous systems. Um, you know, the cars and the railroads were not embedded into my nervous system in the same direct way. Um, and when the digital eats the physical, when the digital infrastructure eats the physical infrastructure, uh, it, it takes over uh, the, the basis from which we're you know, making sense of the world, the way we're thinking, the way we're waking up in the morning, the way kids are developing, especially in a COVID era where kids are at home and they're actually using um, you know, digital technology for, for many more hours per day and they don't actually have school. So we, if we don't have a good understanding of what the fit is between technology sort of as like a brain implant into a society, uh, then we're going to get that wrong. And, you know, if you're going to put a brain implant into a human being, you have FDA approval and a deep understanding for who's trained to put that brain implant into a human before you do such a critical operation that could scramble someone's brain. When you take social media and you to the implant into a society, there's no FDA approval. We've never run this experiment before. And the people who are doing it are 20 something year old, you know, tech uh, you know, engineers who went to computer science schools and rarely have a deep understanding of history or the humanities or, um, you know, kind of Habermas or the kinds of things that make a society work well. And how would you, what would be the biggest sort of frame that you'd use? I know that, that our, our mutual friend, Daniel Schmachtenberger, has talked about that on a kind of finite playing field with exponential tech, what you end up with is sort of self-terminating dynamics. And I, I, I guess my focus as a journalist and, and having kind of moved into the alternative media space, I'm sort of seeing all of these failure conditions of the information space as being reflecting some dynamics that are common across many different systems. But, I'm, but I guess I'm seeing them more in the sort of sense of we're losing all sense of a shared reality. We're losing any sense of common purpose, which just seems like a fundamental problem. But, but I guess it's like the source code we're seeing a sort of faulty source code being amplified by these sort of big tech platforms and the incentive structures pushing towards what certainly feel like self-terminating outcomes if we can't kind of get a grip on it. Yeah, I think, I think the simplest thing for people to get, which is kind of obvious, but it's important just to double underline, is that polarization is profitable because it's more... So because these platforms make money from people's attention, I mean, how much money have you paid for your Facebook account in the last, you know, few years, um, you know, zero. And yet, you know, the stock price is north of $600 billion. And the reason for that isn't just that they quote unquote have your data, it's that they actually need your attention. And there's only so much. I think one of the things that we'll hopefully get to later in this conversation is, you know, the attention economy is a finite um, uh, playing field. It's a finite environment. It's a finite set of resources. Um, and we're not going to grow the size of the attention economy. Although there has been some gains in the fact that once you get people multitasking and paying attention to two things at once, you've technically doubled the size of the uh, extractable attention economy. But there is a finite carrying capacity. So much like with climate change, where I think the, what is the number? I think the average American is, is if everyone consumed like the average American, we would be 40 times over the planet, the Earth's uh, carrying capacity in a year, uh, something like that. So I think with the attention economy, we're actually far over our, um, our finite carrying capacity. And the win-lose game that's being played uh, means that it's, as it gets more and more competitive, I'm, you know, if I don't get your attention, someone else is right there to get it, whether it's YouTube or another you know, YouTube influencer or you know, some, someone else. And that, that finite playing field means that um, if I don't do a good job of getting your attention, then obviously I'm going to lose it. So if I don't personalize your newsfeed, I'm going to be outcompeted by someone who does personalize your newsfeed. So this is really important because let's say you and I are actually uh, brothers 
And we have literally, you know, we're brothers in the same family and we have the same friends and family. We have like very, very aligned. You would think that if you and I both log into newsfeed, we would see almost the same set of things because we're friends with the same people approximately. Um, but that's not how it works at all. Because if I go into your newsfeed and you're a fan of cute, you know, animals, and I'm a fan of deep thinking existential risk uh, videos, we're going to see completely different news feeds, even though we actually have the same basis of quote unquote friends. That's an unprecedented situation. Um, you know, it's often the case that people who live in the same space have the same friends, uh, you know, uh, have, have had that, but their, their attentional sense-making environments are totally different. So in other words, a, a Facebook newsfeed that is personalizing you with affirmation, not information, is going to outcompete a newsfeed that's giving you a broad spectrum of information, which means that things will cleave along the lines of partisan divides. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, Zach Stein, another one of our you know, friends in our community, uh, in Daniel and Jordan's community, has sort of said that this is almost like a social psychotic break, that we've actually kind of fractured the newsphere into uh, at least, especially in kind of the West, um, a left a left kind of oriented uh, sphere of information and a right sphere of information, which of course pre preceded uh, social media in the form of you know Fox News or uh, you know uh, uh, what is it the Murdoch family uh, of properties, um, but but it's now gotten worse because now within that to get attention within that that sphere I have to use outrage. So both sides, the left and the right, are using outrage to get people to get to get people's attention, and then that just further cleaves the kind of divides. And if you look at these graphs of polarization in the United States between, I think it's 2011 and uh, 2018, between the left and the right, you just see it moving further and further apart. Um, there could be an argument that, uh, you know, that's just Fox News versus the MSNBCs of the world, um, but that's, and that social media is not involved. But I really don't think that's true. If you think about the number of times now that, that even television-based news is actually referring to social media as the basis for what they put on air, it's really important to see that social media has become central to the sense-making of, of everyone, including the media. And then the feedback loop, one, one last thing that uh, there is between, in this case, Trump and Fox News, that he gets his own information from social media and from Fox, and then Fox you know, sort of cycles it back to him. So there's this sort of inmates are running the asylum kind of effect that has really uh, driven the world insane. Yeah, and another good frame that I that I was very persuaded by was Jordan Hall, where he talked about that human beings are obligate tribal. That our, our kind of secret power is that we we band together in tribes, and tribes of different temperaments. And Jonathan Haidt talks about how a lot of our political views are actually kind of temperamental biases. So what we've done with social media is we've created these kind of um, tribalization into different temperamental camps largely which jordan talked about as being a kind of extinctionary potentially an extinctionary thing and that that really that really landed with with me the sense that we're kind of basically splitting into these different parts um and we're breaking whatever it was that made us essentially human essentially sort of um effective i mean the easiest proof of that is if you do not have a shared reality and there's no basis upon which you can find agreement or consensus in a world of existential threats where finding consensus on short timelines, like with climate change, are critical and urgent. That's the self-terminating system right there. And that's why we you know, have worked on this with, with that level of intensity is the deep fear that if we cannot find, if we don't have uh, media environments that incentivize the creation of common ground and um, good faith dialogue um, and action instead of just more information. Um, that's another subtle point is that we don't just want a uh, common agreement of information, but then no action because we're all addicted to more and more information, especially in the time of COVID. Um, it's never been easier to just feel like you need to know more about the number of cases in these different countries all around the world, but have no ability to act on it. Um, you know, We really actually need a different kind of media environment that both helps us find consensus and then uh, privileges action. There's actually a good example of this uh, Audrey Tang, who's the digital minister of Taiwan, has some profound work that I recommend people uh, look at that is all around sorting our um, uh, sort of informational environments by unlikely consensus. So they have a system of democratic online deliberation about what problems exist in their society, um, whether it's potholes on the street or uh, you know air filters or where they can buy masks or uh, what Uber drivers should be paid for, have you know, compensation for, and they actually adjudicate these debates online in an online digital space. 
And the digital space is designed so that when people post ideas and two user accounts who normally would disagree on topics, uh, whenever they find consensus and they actually agree, that's the signal that the system ranks highest on the newsfeed. So that kind of gets ranked upwards. And then there's a question about what do we do about it? And then there's a whole process to kind of lead to uh, consensus-based action uh, right after right after there. And it's actually a good example of digital democracies that work, which I think is important for people to know. It's not that social media just means that it, there's no way that social media is compatible with democracy. We have to ask the question, what is the version of it that actually works with uh, democracy? And um, uh, Audrey Tang's work on, on digital Taiwan is one of the best examples of that, which is, which is critical to feel. So we have some hope and optimism that we can do it. Mm, that's interesting. And you, you hinted at it before about sort of the attention, um, that attention is finite. Because I'd like to, to, to talk about kind of the, the free speech paradox that I know that people are really exercised around on Facebook, uh, sorry, on, on YouTube in particular. Um, and there's a very sort of strong bias towards free speech absolutism, which I understand and is kind of initially quite persuasive. But I remember, especially with, I, I did a story about London Real and their sort of um, pivot into con conspiracy thinking and sort of wrestling with a lot of the paradoxes of that, one of which being that actually a lot of like alternative narratives and what might be a conspiracy today is actually something that we need, we need to be part of the information ecology. It turns out that some alternative narratives around COVID, for example, are now part of the understanding of the disease. And there's this sort of paradox of, it seems likely that if the tech platforms start limiting information, they're just going to come down on the on, on the side of the status quo and then squash all alternative narratives. So that's that's a concern. But on the other side, there's this sense of, especially with, with London Real and some of these alternative narratives, they only exist in these little ecosystems where they're not being challenged. So they're not part of the general um, marketplace of ideas. And so I was sort of seeing this splitting off into different, what you might call um, backwaters or eddies of the information landscape, and they're not being challenged. And, and, and there, but, but there was a sort of, when I put these films out, there are a lot of people in the comments saying, you're trying to limit free speech. Free speech has to be absolute. The solution to this is just more free speech. And, and it didn't feel right. It feels a little bit naive, but I'm not entirely sure why it's naive. And I think you might be pointing to something with the idea that in, that attention is finite. Do you want to unpack that? Absolutely. Yeah. This is one of the most critical issues of our time, and we're we're missing the philosophical distinctions we need. Uh, it's important to realize that free speech absolutism and and just the the valuing of free speech was was valued philosophically by the founding fathers at a time when we had an abundance of attention. Um, we needed to make sure that people who um, wanted to speak wouldn't be silenced, but we never thought about is there a finite number of ears to hear everything or do we have a vast overabundance of information and speech compared to the finite number of ears that we have to hear. And it was Herbert Simon in the 1970s, who's uh, sort of a founding person in the space of, I think, both philosophy, cybernetics, and uh, several other fields, um, who, who said that, yeah, when, it, when, it, when information becomes abundant, attention becomes finite. And the question is, how do you manage an attention economy? Um, Tim Wu has a great paper called, um, is the first amendment obsolete where, you know, the, the premise that the solution to bad speech is more speech depends on the idea that there was more attention than a viewer had the patience to see the counter narrative there. But if I can, in Steve Bannon's terms, flood the zone with shit or over just fill the pipe with more conspiracy theories, more questions, more suggested implications about COVID and 5G, about you know, George Soros and Bill Gates and the ID, you know, IDing vaccines, and it's all a conspiracy theory. If I generate more things to look into, then there is time to explore them. That's an adversarial approach to your rule set that we need the solution to bad speech is more speech. And this is exactly the way that we've seen bad actors, uh, you know, use these platforms. Um, you know, when we worked uh, back in 2016, uh, met with Senator Mark Warner and was involved a little bit in the first social media investigations on, on what Russia did in the 2016 elections. And one of my colleagues, Renee Diresta, got full access to that data set. The, the, the approach there is always to try to make powerful suggestions that make people doubt um, the legitimacy of, of, you know, their institutions and, and what's kind of going on around them. And if I can 
offer more and more suggestions that link, whether it's Seth Rich and the DNC and something that happened there, um, or you know, the more the more of these suggestions I can make, uh, the more I can pollute the information ecology and the more things I've created for those for others to do research about. So this is just not a viable approach. And then the other side of it, as you've said, is who do we trust to adjudicate what should and shouldn't be amplified or set? And so this is actually the fundamental challenge of our times, because one of the ironies here is that social media has had an accelerating effect on the delegitimization of our um, sense-making institutions. You know, do you trust or want the Trump administration deciding you know, what should get amplified through regulating Facebook as a national utility? Um, probably not. Do you trust the WHO to be the best authoritative source of information on the coronavirus when, you know, they gave conflicting advice as I think you've covered well in your podcast? Probably not. And do you trust also the vast number of, you know, the populace to simply be making good sense of the situation with very little information from armchairs, not knowing anything about epidemiology? Probably not. And yet were there pockets from a bottom up sense of people who didn't have a background in epidemiology, but were doing their own math and research. Um, I think the famous essay, essay on the, what was it, the hammer and the dance and Tom, Thomas Peo, who I think you interviewed on your podcast, you know, he was a Silicon Valley engineer and not a, um, a medical uh, epidemiologist, but had a background in virality. So this real question is when we have sense-making, um, we we've kind of lost trust in the top down big institutional authorities, whether it's the white house or the WHO. But then if you use the bottom up decentralized mechanisms, we don't have a good way right now to sort whose voices should be amplified, but we can't not choose because there is going to be an amplification. The, the second thing I want to say about this is the distinction between freedom of speech and freedom to reach, uh, which is a distinction that um, Sasha Baron Cohen also added in his speech to the anti-defamation league uh, last year. We all have, according to the U.S. Constitution at least, a, a right to freedom of speech, um, but we don't have a God-given right to stadium-sized audiences of 60,000 people. Um, that's nowhere in the Constitution. That's a thing that actually is a subtle point that Facebook's business model, the business model of the attention economy, uh, is more successful at getting our attention when they give each of us narcissistically a bigger and bigger audience that we can reach, because then now we're more and more addicted to using those platforms. So. Um, this is actually really important to maybe uh, diverge for a second. In, in the attention economy, I think some people, if you've, there's a, a couple of articles I wrote several years ago about how the tech platforms hijack your psychological vulnerabilities to get your attention. They use, you know, slot machine dynamics, you pull to refresh, it gives you a dopamine squirt, you pull to refresh again. They use social proof and approval, like, oh, you've got these seven recommendations, seven people who recommended you on LinkedIn, don't you want to see what they recommended you for or recommend, you know, them for the skills that they have. These are all these kind of cute tricks of ways of getting you to come back to the site. But a very deep point in the evolution of the attention economy to get, to get your attention was actually realizing that uh, instead of people being paid to produce things that generate attention, like journalists who cost $100,000 a year to generate content, um, what if we could convince each person to be their own media channel and do that labor for free? So now suddenly... Um, we're all the free Uber drivers of the attention economy. We're driving around attention and we're not being paid for it. We don't demand to be paid for it because, and we're, we're actually making the platforms more um, addictive for other people to go because now they're seeing content from our friends. And so it's this kind of Ponzi scheme where we're all you know, contributing by posting things. We're contributing things that keep other people addicted to the platform. And that was a huge change and shift in how the platforms evolved. Um, and then YouTube and Twitter are competing or TikTok are competing on what degree of influence we are able to command of these vast audiences. In fact, there's examples of platforms like TikTok um, kind of tricking users into making you think that the number of uh, likes you got was actually that the number of views you got. So kind of inflating the numbers to make it feel like, oh, I'm really influencing this many thousands of people. And the, the more that those numbers go up and the more it can make us feel like we're influencing bigger and bigger pools of people, uh, the more addicted to the platforms we become. But again, none of us were uh, uh, granted some kind of God-given right to reach hundreds of thousands of people. And in fact, it's dangerous to reach hundreds of thousands of people if there's no ethics or no control or no notion of what is a, uh, uh, an ethical, decent, uh, responsible way to contribute to the information environment. And like you're saying, when you have lots and lots of media channels 
simply just providing conspiracy theories because it's a good way of getting attention. I mean, can you imagine, um, you know, a media channel bigger than the BBC uh, in terms of reach, just spouting conspiracy theories and hatred and trying to drive up, you know, racism in society? Well, that's essentially what, let's say, Alex Jones was. Alex Jones was recommended by YouTube 15 billion times. Alex Jones, the InfoWars uh, conspiracy theorist. Um, so YouTube recommended his conspiracy theories 15 billion times, which is more than uh, the combined traffic of, you know, the BBC, Washington Post, New York Times, Fox News combined. And if, so if you ask yourself, like, we're granting the power of the, the sort of narrative exponential broadcasting powers uh, in, in Daniel Schmachtenberger's terms, but we don't provide or, or require any of the kind of wisdom that would go with exponential broadcasting powers, um, any of the media training, any of the, the notion of, for example, in, in media ethics, uh, people learn in, when you're reporting on suicide or reporting on a shooting, you don't publish the photo of a shooter or the name of a sh shooter because it actually inspires more shooters to do the same thing. Or when you publish something on suicide, you don't publish the mechanisms of suicide because we know that it inspires other people to commit suicide. The best data on this was with Robin Williams, I believe, when he committed suicide, that we actually saw an in increase in it inspiring many more uh, suicides very clearly. But any of those rules that have been hard-won lessons for people in journalism and media ethics, those go out the window when you suddenly have legions of you know, thousands and thousands of teenagers with Instagram accounts that reach 15,000 people each, and they're raking in 5,000 bucks a month, 10,000 bucks a month, you know, uh, spouting whatever it is that they want to say. This is the problem. We have totally deregulated the information environment and information ecology where garbage wins, unfortunately. And while there are, what's so tricky about this for everyone is that while there's, there's certain examples where this yields such amazing benefits, I mean, I would say the things I've learned from your channel and the people that are in the network and the Rebel Wisdom sort of network, and you know, how would I have ever discovered these people were it not for a bottom-up way where you could you know, reach 500,000 subscribers or whatever it is that you've got now? Not quite, no, but <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's so many issues that come up listening to you, one of which is that even combating this gets pulled into the polarization and the political spiral as well. Like I was That's aware right. of when you were talking, like you brought up the, the, the Russian involvement in the 2016 election. And I know that there's going to be quite a few comments below this video saying, oh, it's the Russia hoax. And like, I, I find that, so, so there's kind of the narrative warfare that is already going on. And I can understand where that comes from. Like I, I, I understand that the, the issue with, for example, the Russian narrative is that it, it sounds like the, the kind of the mainstream or the traditional media are saying the only reason that someone would be so stupid as to vote for Trump or not vote for Hillary is because they were conned by Russia or they were conned by Cambridge Analytica or they were conned by these people. And it puts off any of the kind of reckoning with the deeper problems with the kind of the neoliberal uh, movement with with all of the the issues with the Democratic Party in 2016, with with the the the, the things that were really going on and the, and the deeper problems with society. And so I hear that so much. I, I, I listened to Renee de Resta and I'd love to talk with her a bit later on as well. And I listened to to you speak, and I think there's there's so many people who just won't even hear the yeah. attempts to address the problem because a lot of the narrative framing of it speaks to, I mean, our, our friend Jordan Hall talks about a blue church framing. So there's, mm -hmm. it's so difficult to even communicate in a way that doesn't activate people's immune systems. And yet, as you know, and, and as I know, like it, Russia has been doing this sort of stuff in Ukraine. They've been doing it in Estonia. This has been part of the Russian tactic. And it's incredibly naive not to assume that they wouldn't do something in 2016. How influential that was and whether there were other reasons for people to vote for Trump is another matter. But there's all this narrative warfare. Um, so I, I just see so many people when they talk about these problems, often they're, they're also making these sort of signaling moves to other people within kind of the blue church paradigm or the mainstream media paradigm. And people, right. there's just no communication across these divides. And I just see it sort of cascade down into outrage and rejection of the entire narrative. Which is ironically a side effect of the polarizing processes of social media that people have been so reinforced with the tribal dynamic that assumes because let's say the Mueller report or whatever, you know, there wasn't a, a connection there with, with, with Trump and, and, and Russia uh, as according to those reports. And then that gets hyped up so much that it assumes that anything with the words Russia and and uh, social media or the election must all be part of that same blue church sort of uh, signaling, you know, uh, construct. 
uh, which is not what I'm suggesting. And, and I do recommend people, we have a, a podcast called Your Undivided Attention, where we interview Renée Diresta, who uh, actually had, she's one of the two teams given full access to Russia's like 200 or something like 200 and something thousand Facebook and Twitter posts that she examined and all the memes and everything. And you can actually hear the way that they use Kermit the Frog memes and a whole bunch of other uh, you know, Simpsons memes and then switch these accounts over midway through to report on other things. Um, there's a whole uh, library there. I think the important thing to talk about uh, with regard to this topic is to realize that we are in a, you know, full force, unconventional narrative warfare uh, environment that, you know, while we're sitting here debating notions of free speech and who should have a platform and, oh my God, YouTube shut down my account because I use the word coronavirus or I use the word Jordan Peterson and, oh my God, they're, you know, they're censoring us. Meanwhile, you know, there are many bad actors who are manipulating the entire thing uh, and, and no one's really realizing that because that also sounds like uh, a conspiracy theory. Um, I think the way to see this is, you know, the challenge of what's happened with social platforms mm -hmm. is that we've they've taken over. They are the new infrastructure. So, you know, our physical world, our world of atoms uh, with our roads, our telephone lines, et cetera, uh, and our, you know, our, our power plants, that's all protected under our national boundaries. If Russia or China tried to fly a plane into the United States, uh, you know, we have, I think it's like we spend $15 billion, billion a day on defense and the Department of Defense is going to shoot it down and make sure that that never happens. So that's protecting the physical infrastructure. But when the digital eats the physical and you move up a layer from the digital to the virtual, uh, sorry, from the physical to the virtual and Russia are trying to try to fly a plane into the, an information plane into Facebook, they're not met by Department of Defense. In fact, the Department of Defense doesn't even know because only Facebook knows who's trying to fly information planes there. And they actually don't have an incentive to look. And they're instead of met by a, you know, a missile defense system, they're met by an algorithm that says, yeah, which zip code or lookalike models or email targeting do you want to target? So in other words, we have a quote unquote defense infrastructure in the digital sphere, which is the opposite of defense. It actually enables the mass manipulation uh, of people at scale. Uh, and I really recommend people check out, um, you know, Renee DeRess's work or our interview with her uh, if they're, if they're curious to learn uh, learn more. But I think this this speaks to the fact that people don't even know that this is happening or think of it as some kind of um, conspiracy theory is is itself uh, an enormous problem. Uh, and I think that, you know, we would do well if the platforms were to implement a policy that whenever uh, a disinformation uh, campaign or what they call coordinated inauthentic behavior is found, that they actually notify people that it actually happened. And that's one of the things that the platforms are not doing is when they actually take down a network of Chinese pages or Iranian pages or Saudi Arabian pages or Israeli pages, uh, they don't actually back notify everyone who was exposed to those things and let them know that that was actually uh, happening. I think one thing that we're, we're needing here is there's this question of when Russia comes in and let's say they amplify Texas secessionist narratives. Okay, so when they do that, what's the problem here? This is actually a really important point. Um, the Texas secessionist narratives weren't created by Russia. They're actually finding organic Texas secessionists inside, let's say, the United States, and then amplifying them to be louder uh, in a time when there's, like, let's say, more you know unrest. So where's the problem there? Because it's our own people saying their own things, but the artificial element is the coordination and the level of amplification of it. And then there might be a bunch of people who agree with that Texas secessionist when they actually amplify it at the right time and say like, yeah, we should really have Texas just secede from the United States. Or yeah, we should have civil war too in these boogaloo groups. And for those who don't know, 64% of the extremist groups that people joined on Facebooks were due to Facebook's own recommendation algorithm, meaning it, they were actually recommending uh, these groups that people joined. And it actually led recently in the case of these boogaloo uh, boys, civil war two groups, to a, a, a federal officer getting killed, getting murdered um, by two Boogaloo boys who had met on Facebook and coordinated the attack. So this is having life and death consequences in the real world. But all that's just to say that, uh, you know, I think we have a massive information war going on and we don't think of the geopolitical contest between the US and the West and China and Russia as, as occurring yet. We think of we're in some kind of stalemate or a cold war, but it's not the case at all. Uh, we have no digital borders while we've been so you know, paranoid about our physical borders and building the wall, we've left the digital borders wide open. Uh, and the United States is actually not protecting its infrastructure very well at all. And I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about what, what can be done about this sort of spiral. I'd, I'd like to throw in an, an, an example that I think, 
I think I, I don't know whether it's so it's so well known in America about the creation of the BBC, because in the 1920s we we had these new technologies. We had radio, we had television, and this sort of sense that um, these were far, vastly more powerful technologies than the written word. And the BBC was created in the UK as a way, it was sort of at an arm's length from government, sort of renewed every 10 years um, to, to manage these new technologies because there was a fear that the, there was a, a level of coordination that was possible, there was a level of propaganda that was possible with them that hadn't been possible before. And I think you then saw in the 1930s in Germany what could happen if they were used for propaganda. So in a, in a way that was a very far-sighted um, realization to, that some kind of organization needed to be created. And I think yep. the BBC kind of worked pretty well up until fairly recently. And I think a lot of people have criticisms of the BBC, like for, for groupthink and the, the commercial pressures on it as well, I think have led to something of a race to the bottom for them as much as for anyone else. But there was at least some sense of there has to be some some civic space or some sense of truth that is not subject to corporate pressures. So the BBC still doesn't, doesn't take advertising. It still has, has a, a real reputation around the world. And from the beginning of the COVID crisis, actually the, the value of the BBC, the amount of trust that people had in the BBC has gone up massively since the beginning of COVID. So mm. it's sort of this sense of once there is a crisis, people do tend to, no matter what they say about kind of, the BBC when they're not in a time of crisis, when there is a time of crisis, that's where they go to to look for truth. But but when I think about some kind of parallel process with social media, the fact that they're corporate actors, the fact that they're they're subject to those incentive systems, I can't imagine a process that, that you might be able to go through to create that kind of, um, yeah, create that kind of structure. But but it is it is a similar parallel in a way, a sort of historical historical analogy at least. Absolutely, yeah. We we make this this metaphor link uh, all the time. And again, I recommend for people Tim Wu's book, The Attention Merchants, which goes through the history of the um, you know the, those who were selling attention and the commodity of attention as a as a product. And the importance of the BBC is saying that there needs to be a kind of civic or social. Um, uh, broadcasting space that is guided by the public interest for the public uh, interests, not for private interests. And I think that's what we've lost that, that when the digital ate the physical, um, the, what was the digital, you know, when Mark Andreessen's quote, the software is eating the world. Why did he say that software is eating the world? He, Mark Andreessen was the founder of Netscape because the point is that software can do anything that uh, our technology can always add efficiencies that that can't be found without the technology. So in general, no matter what domain of life is, whether it's taxis or advertising or um, you know, energy or nests, like in your home, you're gonna add technology because it's gonna add efficiencies that are not going to be there without it, which means that software is going to eat up and gobble up every part of our lives, which means that when the, di the digital will eat the physical, but who's making the digital? The digital was not made by states with public interests, with careful people and you know wise elders and coming out of Bretton Woods trying to say you know what what should we, you know how should we design this to be best for people and do it in the best interests of people. The digital became uh, what a handful of you know, literally like five major U.S. based tech platforms and a couple in China uh, that have ate the physical infrastructure. Uh, and that that is the uh, when and when that happens, the private interests eat the public interests, and that's the problem. So the question is, how do you get back to a publicly interested um, kind of BBC public broadcasting type model, but more of a public social media? Um, what is public interest social media look like? Uh, and that's close to the some of the work that we're doing at the Center for Humane Technology is trying to move ourselves off of these bad incentives. Um, you know, the other problem here is just the problem of runaway, you know, um, predatory capitalism growth, um, where, you know, if you, if you think of why we're so stuck with these private corporations who, who, who lead to these harms, um, in the same way that in, in you know, uh, reg regular predatory capitalism, if a whale is worth more dead than alive and a tree is worth more as a dead slab of lumber than it is as a tree, we're going to, you know, it's going to be more profitable to take every tree and turn it into lumber and take every whale and turn it into a dead whale. In the attention capitalism model, uh, we're going to have, it's going to be more profitable for a person to be addicted, outraged, polarized, and disinformed than if they're just a human being or a citizen uh, of, a, of, a, 
of a society. Um, because I, I think of, you know, we talked about consciousness as we were starting this interview and the link between consciousness and attention. And I think of the way that these platforms harvest attention as almost like the dead lumber, these dead slabs of attention of, of consciousness that we're mining and commodifying into sort of passivity, uh, addiction, loneliness. We haven't talked about the many other social harms that are emerging here, the harms of teenagers, teenage girls, uh, the rising of teen suicides and depression and isolation because of the way that we've hooked up an entire generation to variable social approval and reinforcement for, um, uh, where your identity is reinforced when you look different than you actually do. We, people only like you when, if you only looked a little bit different than you actually do. Uh, there's all of these side effects that come from this privatization of human attention as a commodity as opposed to as something sacred. And so much like if you know Michael Sandel's work on uh, the moral limits of markets, and I think the book is called What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets, that we have become a market society. We've let markets actually intrude into every aspect of our lives instead of asking, where is the boundary? What is public space? What is the national park that we don't say is for drilling? What are the parts of the ocean that we don't say are for dead whales? What are the parts of the forest and the Amazon that we need for you know, being the effective carbon basins for climate change that we don't want to just leave to uh, uh, deforestation and, and, and harvesting for lumber? And that's kind of the bigger question here is that when the digital eats the physical, we have private interests, runaway private interests, uh, eat the public interest. Uh, now, that's not saying let's dismantle all of capitalism. That's just saying where is the boundary between you know, making sure we have a sustainable, non-self-terminating civilization? And I think those questions are far more important than, hey, did YouTube flag my video? And maybe that one video got demonetized. Like we're talking about whether the collective psyche can make sense of the world in an accurate way and find consensus-based decision-making mechanisms like at a very fast time scale in the case of some of the problems that we're facing. You, you mentioned, I think, in the conversation with, with Tim Ferriss that we, we've tied business success to capturing human beings and that addiction is, is basically the model that we're ru running on at the moment. Can you, can you just unpack that? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, an addicted user is you, spends more attention on a product than a non-addicted user. And so much like what happened, there's a great book called Salt, Sugar, Fat about you know, the food industry. And they talk about stomach share. It's the same thing. I've got a finite rival versus race for the finite amount of hunger that someone's going to have in their life. Well, how do I you know, get more uh, profits? I need to grow the base of people buying the food that I'm creating. Well, I need to turn people into wanting more food than they actually have room for in their stomachs. I need to double the size of the stomach share economy. You do that by you know, introducing diabetes and giving people artificial you know, uh, salt, sugar, fat type things that increase their, um, uh, their need for more food without actually really needing it on an underlying basis. And if they're going to use this combination of salt and sugar, and I'm not using that combination of salt and sugar, uh, I'm going to lose. The, there's a very concrete example of this where I think it was with like uh, Cheez-Its and some of the other products, they tried adding more salts. And when they, you know, obviously people bought more of it. When a CEO came in to, I think it was General Mills Foods in 2004, I think her name was Betsy something. Um, and she said, you know, I'm going to put caps on the amount of salt, sugar, and fat that we're actually adding to our products. We have to actually put limits on this because I see that we're causing diabetes. And they did that. And then within a quarter later, their, their you know, revenue started to drop a little bit. And they're on the call with investors in Wall Street. And they say, why is your revenue dropping? And they talk about the caps on the foods and they kick out the CEO. They remove the limits on salt, sugar, fat, and get back to business as usual. It's the same thing here with Facebook. You know, they depend on t attention. And if they don't get it, their view is, well, Netflix or YouTube is going to come sweeping in for that attention if we don't do it ourselves. And we think we're going to do a good job managing it anyway. So we have to use the addiction, the shiny, blingy red dots versus the white dots. We have to have the auto-playing videos instead of waiting for you to hit play. We have to, you know, add the triple you know, ellipsis dotted thing saying someone's typing a comment so that you're staying more, you're waiting to see what the comment's going to be. You know, these are all tricks to keep your attention. And if they don't do those things, if I start pulling back from that race, I'm just going to get outcompeted by the guys who do do it. In this case, that might be a Chinese company like TikTok. So it actually becomes a geopolitical contest for it's not just if I don't do it, the other guy will. If I don't do it, maybe China will. And the, the future of the internet is going to become, you know, the China TikTok internet. So we, we have this problem of you know, the game of power. And when the game of power is happening in the psychological domain, that game of power is happening over a substrate of human attention. And in that world, addiction is going to be more profitable than a non-addiction based product. How do you solve a problem like that? You have 
you know, either regulation or an Apple or Google who are actually the invisible regulators of the attention economy, since all of this is taking place within either a Mac OS or an iOS on a phone uh, or an Android OS on, a, on an Android phone. And they could sort of set rules and limits saying, hey, we actually don't allow these kinds of bad practices. Um, so they can actually act as top-down regulators. And that's where you saw, you know, a couple of years ago, them adopting time well spent, which was some of the frameworks that we had laid out. Uh, it's a very minimal uh, adoption of, of some of the much more expressive and, and long-term um, protopian kind of ideas of what uh, an economy would look like where technology is competing to help us spend our time well instead of competing for capturing our attention. But you know, the minimal thing that they've got there is things like uh, limits on how much screen time they have and showing you how many times you picked up your phone and the charts and graphs and all that stuff. So that that's an example of things moving slightly in the right direction. But we really need not just you know, in the race to the bottom to bring up the bottom so you can't compete that low. We need to change what we're competing for, which is very much like with, you know, our system of markets. We don't want to be competing just for extraction and demand and profits. We want to be competing for social outcomes, things that make our society better, that reify, you know, um, soulfulness and, and vivia, you know, conviviality and the kinds of things that make life worth living. And that's where technology is it's actually wrong at a deeper level. Yeah, and I've heard you express attention as sacred before. And it really, I think it was again in the in the Tim Ferriss podcast where I was listening to you comparing your meditation background, talking about your meditation background, and Tim was talking about it as well. And this sense of, I think you said something like, um, unless we are paying attention, unless we're aware of what's going on in our bodies and and minds when we're interacting with these technologies, we've already lost this sort of sense of we need to become aware of what of what's going on and become self-aware of how we're being hijacked. Um, it reminds me, we put out a, a series called the, the uh, Psycholo Science and Psychology of Polarization, where we talked about polyvagal theory mm. and this sense of can we become aware of when we're in a defensive frame of mind, when we're in an expansive frame of mind and become curious about the difference because that can shift us out of that defensive framework, just being curious about when we go into that. I, I'm interested if you could kind of outline that and what are the tools that we can start taking back control ourselves of what's going on? Yeah, there's so much in this area. It's, it's so rich because we're talking about human consciousness at the end of the day here and free will. Um, I think any place where we're being hijacked and don't know it and don't see it or don't name it or witness it is a place where we've lost choice. So if... I am being hijacked outrage and I'm, I see someone make a comment about, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests and I'm just eager to jump in and get, you know, if that's happening through outrage, it's happening through an automated process because I'm not choosing that outrage. That outrage happens and comes over me um, in the same way that, you know, if I'm um, in, in any case of uh, sort of, sort of using technology and social media, if I don't see that something has actually happened, then I am actually being taken over by by a process, um, and and you know Yuval Harari and I who've done a couple of talks together, um, you know, is the author of, of Sapiens, and we talk about the problem is is when technology knows us better than we know ourselves, and if you don't know yourself as well as the technology does, um, you're going to lose. So it's this kind of race, you know, when you're a kid, you know, he makes this metaphor of. Um, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, your, your mother might know something about your needs better than you might know about yourself. And they, you know, take appropriate actions based on that. But the mother knowing that thing about you is not trying to manipulate you into profit maximization for her benefit, right? She's generally thinking about what's good for, you know, what kind of food is good for you. They're just not going to think about, well, I'm going to feed you the Cheez-Its because I'll make more money from the Cheez-Its company that's going to pay me if I give you the Cheez-Its. If I take a moment and zoom back out, um, what this is really about in the relationship between a human being and technology is an asymmetry of power where the technology knows something about you that you may not know about yourself or it's acting based on that. The question is, what is its motive when it has that asymmetric power? If its motive is profit maximization, that's like, you know, if you imagine other situations in human life where we have asymmetric power. So you walk into a doctor's office, the doctor has a lot more knowledge about, about medicine. And you're going to share lots of personal information about your case because you want to get most helped by that person. The more you share, the more they can help you. So you don't want it to be like, I need to protect the value of privacy when I walk into the doctor's office. I want them to know the most about my case so they can help me the most. But if that doctor made money just by maximizing whatever they could say that would get me to, to say yes to the most expensive surgery or to take the most drugs or whatever, 
that's going to be a very problematic situation, which is why doctors have this fiduciary obligation to care for, you know, your, you know, to do no harm, the Hippocratic Oath, and to care about, you know, essentially your, your best interests. Same thing with a lawyer. You know, a lawyer has massive asymmetric understanding of you know, the law. And so when you share with them all your information, they better be using that to your best interest, not just selling it to, you know, the other side, if they pay them enough, then they'll make more money. Like they can't, they can't be in that kind of relationship with technology. We are sharing lots of information with these systems so they can build a better and better predictive model about us and know something about us that we may not know ourselves. Uh, Yuval Harari says in the interview we did together that, you know, he's gay. And, you know, when he was 13, did he know he was gay? No. No. Do you think that a computer would be able to predict that he was gay based on his click patterns and whether they show him a Coca-Cola ad with, you know, a, a attractive male versus an attractive female? They would know that about him earlier than he, they would, he would know that about himself. And the question is, what do they do with that information? If they're in a asymmetric relationship and then they're just going to profit off the most, you know, the, the whatever gives them the most money, that's going to be uh, the problem. And so we like to say that we've misclassed the relationship with technology as being in an equal or symmetric uh, relationship. We've pretended like a magician does that I'm just saying to you, hey, pick a card, any card, meaning this is a deck. I'm a person, you're a person. I'm just giving you a neutral choice here to pick whatever you want. It appears like, you know, it's, it's masquerading as a symmetric or equal um, a choice making environment. When in fact, in this case, the magician actually has all this information based on their knowledge of psychology of exactly what they're going to get you to do to pick the thing they want. The same thing is true of technology. It makes the illusion that it's just a mirror being held up to society saying, hey, you picked your friends, you picked the links you clicked on. So if you're getting white nationalists coming out the other end and killing people, that's just reflection of your own society. But they've actually stacked the deck upstream where they know the kinds of things that will get you to keep clicking. So the, the issue is that we don't have a, a caring or fiduciary relationship with technology. And that's what we, we need. Uh, I sometimes use the metaphor that um, you know, using Facebook is like walking into a, a confession booth with a priest, except the priest is listening to 2 billion people's confessions and not just the stuff you share consciously, but the invisible stuff that you don't know that you're sharing through your eye movements and your micro expressions and things like that. And they have a supercomputer next, next to them that's calculating based on all the confessions that anyone's ever made when they walked into the confession booth, what confession you're about to make before you know you're going to make it. And then they use all that information not to help you the most, but to actually sell it to advertisers. And like, how screwed up would that be? This, this metaphor tends to work better in Europe where there's uh, lots of churches around. Um, you know, how screwed up would it be to have that amount of asymmetric information be uh, used for private interest? And that's the problem that we have to solve. We need to make sure that that fiduciary obligation is, is actually acting in the best interest of people in society. I find the framing around the sacredness of attention really, really powerful. I'm also struck by the fact that a lot of people who thought the most deeply about this, you mentioned Yuval Noah Harari, Sam Harris also has a meditation app, yourself. Lots of people have, have, have really been paying attention to the contents of their own minds and they're very, they're very um, well-practiced in meditation. They're very well-practiced in the, in the focus of attention. And I find that really an interesting, an interesting idea. And I, I, I get the sense that it's only by somehow mainstreaming the idea of attention as something sacred and of human connection as something sacred that we might be able to kind of change the narrative around this. And that seems to be like maybe a, a, a crux point in this conversation. It is. It's, and it's funny you're, you're mentioning it because it's, it's hard for people to value it to that extreme. I mean, it, it's much like, um, you know, with climate change, after you wake up and you realize that your entire, you know, you've got the petrodollar and the entire economy is actually based on oil. Our entire economy is hooked up to the extraction and the manipulation of human attention. So if we were ever to reclassify it as sacred and not something that we extract, not something that we commodify, not something that we treat as dead slabs of, you know, manipulational uh, potential, um, which is kind of what where we're at right now, that means reversing out of... Um, a whole bunch of GDP that is based on that manipulation of attention. Um, I forgot the exact numbers on how big advertising is as a as a part of the GDP, but it's 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 enormous. Um, you know, surveillance capitalism, which is the theme that's undergirding everything we've been talking about, the greater and greater prediction of human behavior based on the manipulation of these subtle characteristics and creating slight changes to your your, your you know behavior, your uh, minds, your biases and beliefs. That, that economy is where a lot of the growth in the stock market has come from. 
So um, that doesn't change the fact that attention is sacred because it's the foundation of choice. If you are not aware or can slow down to see and gain, I think Jordan Hall calls this like simulated thinking versus non-simulated thinking. You know, most of us, including something what I was doing just a couple minutes ago, is repeating certain things that are phrases and scripted lines that are powerful ways to explain a thought. Um, I'm aware that I'm doing that, but um, if we really need to make new choices and put new choices on life's menu, then we need to be able to have a basis of attention, a basis of consciousness that allows us to do something different or new, to think something new that we weren't thinking before. And we have a system right now with social media that broadly narrows the space of human sense making and choice by reinforcing the old biases. Yes, those other people on the other side are still wrong. Yes, uh, you know, those people over there still don't like me or still, I still need that attention from them. We're, we're narrowing the human experience. And I, the big question we're going to have is, can we go back and treat this as something sacred? Um, you know, and I think of it like the birth of the EPA and the Environmental Protection Agency, the birth of the National Park Service, you know, in the U.S. Can we have a attention protection agency? Uh, Andrew Yang um, in his presidential platform actually called for a department of the attention economy and even uh, at the time mentioned me by name as, you know, running something like that to uh, get into a conversation about how do we treat attention, especially of younger people, the young the young youthful parts of the attention economy that are the future generations whose sense-making needs to be, uh, you know, uh, grounded and, and informed and, and, and powerful uh, for the future of national security and national competitiveness. Um, we need to protect attention and, and treat it as sacred. And, you know, that's part of the work that we're, we're trying to do. Yeah. Thank you, Tristan. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I was quite familiar with this conversation, but it was only actually listening to a few of your kind of intensively to your, your, your podcast, especially with Tim Ferriss, that I really made the link between meditation, consciousness, and attention, and and it just just really ma made clear the sacredness of, of of that. So I think, um, yeah, I think that that seems to be the crux point. So I'm I'm really hoping that you continue with your work and manage to to mainstream this idea of attention as sacred because I think it's it's so important. We do need to mention it more often. Thank you for the reminder of that. It's, it tends to be one of those points that um, sounds more fluffy. You know, it sounds just like woo, woo, blah, blah, you know, attention is sacred. Uh, you don't really realize it, I think, until you've, you know, seen the degree to which our minds are hijacked by the default mode network and constantly looping in, especially in Corona times, uh, the kind of uh, amplification of lower level automated processes and anxieties as opposed to genuine, new, calm, you know, choices. So. Great. Thank you very much for joining me, Tristan. And I hope we stay in touch. Likewise, David. Thanks. Good to, good to see you here. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.